Welcome to More Than a Broker, the podcast that goes beyond the traditional definition of a logistics provider. My name is Andrew Elsner, co-founder of Spot. In each episode, we will dive into the stories of industry experts, keep you up to date on the highs and lows of the logistics marketplace, and introduce you to the people behind the advanced technologies that are driving innovation for brokers, shippers, and carriers within our industry. Join us as we explore the world of logistics through a different lens. This is More Than a Broker. Drivers, start your engine! Welcome to More Than a Broker. Uh, I'm Andrew Elsner, co-owner here at Spot. And today, as we kick off our podcast, we're going to be discussing double brokerage, uh, how it's impacting our industry, and things that people can do to prevent double brokerage in our industry. And today, as as we kick off our podcast, I have two individuals from our team uh, that work day in and day out with carriers, carrier compliance, carrier safety, and have helped set up an infrastructure to prevent double brokerage. First, I have Tanisha Duet and Craig Hunter. Uh, again, both been with the company for a while. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. And, and Tanisha, if you want to introduce yourself uh, a little bit about what you do here, how long you've been with us, and then Craig, we'll move to you. Sure. So my name is, again is Tanisha Dewitt. I'm the Carrier Resources Manager. I've been with Spot a little over eight years now, and I oversee carrier onboarding and compliance as well as the claims department. My name is Craig Hunter. I'm the Director of Operations here at Spot. Uh, I've been here uh, a little bit over nine years and oversee our uh, track and trace team as well as our, you know, work with Tanisha with our carrier onboarding and our compliance teams in the kind of grand scheme of things that we all work together trying to prevent uh, imposters or, or bad actors getting into the system. And as we begin, Tanisha, I think it'd be good for those that don't know uh, or to walk us through what double brokerage is. We'll start there, and then we'll we'll look at how that can impact a, a shipper. Sure. So double brokering is essentially a shipment being tendered to one broker, and then without the permission, knowledge, or consent of that broker or customer, the freight is being given to another party. This could be for just to gain profit through dispatching it to a different company, or some of the things that we'll go into a little bit deeper in a minute. Um, It can sometimes result in theft of cargo and things like that. So essentially, freight being brokered to one broker and then uh, without permission or consent of the cargo owner or that broker, the freight is being tendered to someone else. So you said two things there that I think uh, so that the audience can understand. How is theft happening and how does that impact the, the shipper or receiver? Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about a couple of different ways that double brokering can happen. The first one I call just old school double brokering is when um, a shipment is contracted to one carrier, they dispatch it to another carrier and make a couple hundred bucks. The shipment delivers on time, everything goes well. Most people don't know that this happens, but it does. But a lot of times people are double brokering just to make a few hundred bucks. So that's old school. (laughs) The new way of double brokering that we've seen more recently is cargo theft. So the shipment is being brokered to one carrier who we think we may be working with, but unfortunately it could be an imposter or an impersonator, someone that does not truly work for that company. They send someone in to do what's called a fictitious pickup. That carrier picks up the load with no intention of delivering it and just kind of falls off the grid. And the low disappears at that point. And Craig, when you look at your nine years and and working on this, what are some of the biggest changes in in the size of the scams uh, that you've seen? Yeah. So when you talk about the the, the sizes of the scams, and I think Tanisha alluded to this a little bit on the small scale that where a carrier is rebrokering a load to another uh, another carrier and they're trying to skim a little bit off the top or they're trying to accept payment from the original broker and not pay the you know the carrier that actually hauled the load at all but where this really kind of steps up to the next level and uh, from an exposure side is 
when the carrier that's double brokering the freight gives the legitimate motor carrier a different delivery address than where the, the freight is intended to. So they'll, you know, they'll tell them it's pick it up from the place it's actually picking up and then they'll give them a address that doesn't match the BOLs that the carrier that actually picked up the load uh, has received. And so they'll take this to a third party warehouse, a different address than it's intended to. And then from there, they could, there could be a couple other carriers that uh, get burnt coming in and picking up what they think is a legitimate load until it makes it to its final destination and is essentially sold out into the, uh, you know, either into the public or sold for a, a good amount of profit. We're talking to, if we're talking about a hundred thousand dollar load that essentially costs this uh, imposter nothing to get their hands on. There's, it, it can, it can become pretty lucrative and it, it's a large exposure for the cargo owners and for the people that were entrusted with the freight in the, in the beginning. And, and Tanisha, when you, you mentioned something uh, about profit. So the scammer is going out to make a couple hundred dollars, three, four hundred dollars. If I'm a shipper and I've hired a, an asset based carrier that's brokering the load or a broker that's going to broker the load, they've sold it to somebody performing a double broker. And then an unknowing carrier hauls the load. So they deliver the load as requested. What exposure does a shipper have to paying that invoice? Or what exposure does the broker have to paying that invoice? The shipper is definitely responsible. It, it comes down to the cargo owner. Whomever owns the cargo is going to be who's responsible to pay that freight rate, which can be very, you end up upside down in shipments a lot of times or paying double on shipments because if you've compensated as a, as a shipper, if you've compensated your broker once for the load and then you have someone, a carrier that comes back and says, no, I actually did this load, then, you know, you're on the hook for having to compensate that, that carrier as well. Because, again, whomever the cargo owner is, is who's responsible for paying the freight charges. And the same thing goes for a broker. If you see these things, obviously, you don't necessarily want these issues to escalate to a customer level. So you, you know, handle them firsthand and again, you would end up paying double on a shipment. So if you tendered this load to ABC Trucking, turns out ABC Trucking actually gave it to John Boy Transportation and didn't pay John Boy for the load, John Boy has every right to circle back and pursue spot for compensation of those freight, you know, for the freight charges. And, you know, ABC Trucking is now in the wind. So you're at a loss on those shipments each time this happens. So essentially, uh, if you're a broker, and this happens, uh, there is a, a need to make sure that the, from a shipper level, that the shipper isn't having to pay double. Uh, but and a lot of times you end up paying twice for this load. Out of curiosity, in your day to day, when you see this, what percentage of, of these loads end up with a, a fuel advance on the shipment? The majority of them have fuel advances. That's another type of scam that we see because of course, the, the scammer is trying to get as many dollars as they can as quickly as they can. So when they are attempting to steal these, if if the shipper catches on to them or the broker catches on to them, obviously they're not going to be successful. So just in case, they may call in and say, hey, I, have a, I need a fuel advance for the shipment. Here's the paperwork. You send them 1500 bucks as a fuel advance. You know, that's still 100% profit for them. And it's obviously not funds that are truly going to the carrier hauling the load. These are just dollars that are being pocketed by the scammer. So that's another one that we see often along with fake lumper receipts. People produce fake lumper receipts after saying they've delivered a load. Their driver's on site. He needs a T-check for X amount. But obviously the driver does not need a lumper and he's probably not even there. So if, if you're not careful, that can definitely be something that you run into as well. To, if, to add into that a little bit on the, you know, on, on things for carriers and shippers uh, to be on the lookout for. First thing on, on the shipping side, if, you know, if, if an appointment scheduled and uh, the broker that you're working with has given you the MC of the carrier and the driver name, a quick check to make sure that's the actual truck that's picking it up. Um, and, you know, a couple of questions on where are you delivering this to, you know, who's the broker that you received this load from, et cetera. A couple of checks on the front end can go a long way. And I also think it's important having spoken with carriers that have fallen victim to, 
you know, picking up what they thought was a legitimate load. If it seems too good to be true, you know, if the rate uh, seems very high for current conditions or a current lane, that's a, that's, that, that can be a red flag. Also, if the, you know, once you pick up the load, if the, the person is really, you know, kind of hammering you for a BOL and asking you to send that BOL to a, an email address that doesn't make sense for, you know, why they're sending it to you or, or why they're using that email address. Again, those are, th- those can be red flags and it's important, especially in this, the, the current environment where these scams and everything are kind of running rampant that everybody involved in the, in the supply chain is, is extra diligent on just, you know, fact checking or looking for these red flags. What do we do? Um, if you think day to day, we move a couple thousand loads a day, uh, back to this fuel advance. This is something that really, if you think about it, it's pretty scary. A carrier picks up a load, wants a 30 to 40% advance on, on the rate. What are things that, that we do internally and that other people can do to stop carriers or catch carriers trying to get the fuel advance? So there's a, there's a couple of things. You know, first of all, it's uh, in your onboarding and vetting process, being leery of somebody that's it's their first load with you and they're, they're, they're requesting an advance. We should make a rule to not, to not do that with carriers that, is, that are newly set up with you. I think the second and kind of the, really the biggest thing is confirming that the the driver is actually on site at that facility. So if you use a location tracking, whether it's through their ELD or through through an application, confirming that that driver is actually there and having that driver send you a picture of the of the BOLs directly from the driver. And I think that goes both ways too with with the advance too. If you're going to issue the advance, you know the safest way is to get a pay, a payment link directly from the shipping facility. So you can confirm that you're paying the, or I'm sorry, that's for a lumper, but uh, on, on a fuel advance, again, it comes back to the tracking and confirming that the the carrier is on tracking. It's, it's, it's pretty hard for the, you know, for the, for the driver to be tracking on a load if they're not a real, you know, if it's not a real carrier that comes back to validating the phone numbers and, you know, making sure that the information that you have is, is accurate before before issuing that advance and then giving that directly to the driver as opposed to sending an advance through a, to a dispatcher or to somebody else unassociated with the, with actually moving the load. Tanisha, when you look at carrier onboarding, so when we bring carriers into the network and vet them, what are some of the key things that you look at to onboard somebody? One of the the things we look for primarily is obviously we want to make sure we know that who we're we know who we're working with, right? Because we've seen some folks contact us via email attempting to onboard companies that they're not affiliated with whatsoever. So we've made sure by checking um, FMCSA website and other third-party sites, we verify the contact information for that company. So we look for the name, we're looking at the email address, making sure that the phone numbers that we have on file actually match what the FMCSA has on file. And not only that, we validate that number. So we go into, again, another third-party website to make sure that, is this a cell phone number? Is it a landline? Is it a voice over IP, which is just an internet-based phone number that someone can create and use from anywhere? So we make sure that all of the contact information is correct. We obviously standard documents, your certificate of insurance, W-9, things like that. The main thing that we've really had to focus on heavily is the contact information because, again, these impersonators are creating email addresses that are very similar, just off by one letter or one number, but very similar to the true contact. And you would almost miss it if you're not looking, if you're not paying attention. So we we focus on that pretty heavily. So in my 20-some years in the industry, th- this theft uh, that's come about in the past uh, couple years has, has been something that's very, for lack of a better term, it's crazy to see the amount of identity theft that's happening. And it's actually, it's pretty scary uh, to look at in our industry with the onset of technology. So going to a portal, setting up in a portal. Can you walk me through some of the things you're seeing from an identity theft? Because I, I the claims and the things that I'm seeing with with the theft, they're more sophisticated with identity theft than I've ever seen. So I didn't know if uh, the both of you had some things to look for. So are they stealing email addresses? Are they uh, buying URLs? How are they copying phone numbers? 
How are they copying insurance? What, what are the things to look for with carriers today that, or, or people that are scamming other people's identity? I think some of the things to really be on the lookout for, and you, talk, you, you talked about it, right? Like stealing an email address or, you know, with how everything is kind of uh, pulls together today, somebody can say that their name is Fred Smith from 123 Trucking, right? It's important to know if, you know, if the carrier has an actual domain or doesn't have an actual, you know, or doesn't have a domain. We've seen a lot of cases where it's the trucking company name at gmail.com. They only communicate to you via email and that other legitimate tr- uh, motor carrier actually has their own domain within their email. You can go and fake a phone number that uh, gets pretty close to what the other phone number is uh, as well. So it's, it's, I think the most important thing in this is having a, uh, having a source of truth that you can reference to validate the contact information. And then also being in tune to other reports or other, other services that might be uh, calling out alerts on different motor carriers that have had issues with, with identity theft. So you can take steps to, to validate back to the legitimate emails that you do have on file or the legitimate phone numbers that you do have on file and, and call and reach out to those people and ask if this person should be associated with them. So if I hear you, the, they can copy, get as close to the email address, especially with Gmail, Yahoo, any type of email address where if it's truck125 at, at Gmail, they're, they're copying truck124 at Gmail. Correct. Yeah, I think the other thing too is don't just assume because there's, you know, I'll use the Fred Smith again, right? Let's say Fred is with ABC Trans, but ABC Trans is a two or three truck operation and they do, their legitimate email is Fred Smith at gmail.com. And this person comes in and they purchase ABC Trans domain. And now you get an email from somebody that's Fred at ABC Trans.com just because there's a domain associated with it doesn't necessarily mean it's legitimate. You know, you need to rely on your systems and you need to, you need to double check and make sure that everything aligns with the records that you have on file. Tanisha, with the onset of cargo theft, so in the, the example you gave where the brokerage is selling it to a carrier that, or a broker that's selling it to a carrier, they're giving them fake address to deliver. It's going to a warehouse that's then cross-docking it and selling it on the market. What are things that shippers can do to help catch this? Uh, One thing that I would recommend every shipper does is make sure that they get, I think Craig kind of talked about this earlier, ask the carrier what broker they received the load from. Obviously, if it's a double broker load, it's going to show someone other than, you know, the true broker. So that's one red flag. And then um, obtaining contact information. So phone number for the driver a copy of the driver's license um, and just verifying the details of the load as far as the destination that the carrier shows on their side versus where the load is truly going to make sure that the information matches. I think one thing to add to that as well uh, from the shipper perspective is just because you have a carrier, let's take a customer pickup load as an example, just because you have a customer pickup load picking up today and you've got a carrier on site that's saying they're here to pick up this load going to that destination be diligent about pickup numbers, reference numbers, and everything like that. If you if, if you're not utilizing a unique pickup number for each each shipment, that's a you should not you should never release a load to a driver without a pickup number. They should be able if it's a legitimate uh, driver with a legitimate you know the, 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 that received the load from a legitimate broker, they should be able to get the access that pickup number fairly quickly. Yeah, I'd also I think some of the things from the the picture of the license plate to add to that trailer markings, making sure that the trailer number, uh, the inside of the trailer also line up and are recorded. I think that's critical. Some of the other things too is making sure the uh, signature on the bill lading in and out times uh, are also things that can help from a shipper's perspective. Tanisha, when you when you think about all the carriers, we have say 70,000 carriers within our database. What are things from the setup that you look at from the MCS 150 that say, hey, this is a carrier that legitimately operates as a for hire property carrier versus somebody that, that's out to scam uh, other people. Yeah. So the MCS 150, one of the things that we look at is um, 
the mileage recorded versus the number of power units that a carrier has. So for example, we look for an average of about 80,000 miles per year per unit. That's typically what it takes for a trucking company to be profitable. So we look for that. We also look for inspections. So DOT inspections, roadside inspections, level one and two inspections. And that's because obviously if you're not an asset-based carrier, there's no way that you're gonna be stopped by the DLT roadside. So we know that um, those companies are legitimate too. Yeah, those inspections are, are critical, especially on the onboarding process, right? It's, it's uh, you know, requiring a, a, a number of inspections, vehicle inspections to have occurred. Obviously that vehicle is, it, when it's inspected, it, it is tied back to that motor carrier. I think too, you, you could be on the lookout for change in ownership or, or pending authority. Let's say that, you know, their insurance is set to expire and their authority is in the pending status. You know, that's another red flag to this could be a carrier that's going out of business or has gone out of business and they just, their insurance hasn't expired yet. And somebody is, you know, trying to get a couple of loads moved through there prior to their authority going inactive. If you think about, we move 500,000 shipments a year and, and are there any stories or any cases that stick out to you as, as the, as the craziest story, the, the most sophisticated identity theft or theft scenario that you'd share with us? I definitely have one, but Tanisha, would you like to go first? I was going to say, I think mine would be a scammer impersonating a customer. It was a scammer. They were actually impersonating a carrier and a customer. So they reached out to us and pretended to have four loads that needed to pick up. They gave us an address, gave us some PO numbers. And um, fast forward, by the time we figured it out and kind of investigated the situation, we realized the same day that this customer onboarded with us and sent us these POs, it was the same day that this one carrier onboarded with us and booked all four of the loads. So we kind of started connecting the dots, called to verify the information on the shippers and just to find that the loads weren't legitimate. The PO numbers were completely fake. That particular customer had been wanting to work with us, but hadn't actually tendered us any loads yet. So that actually <laughs> ended wow. up getting us more business from them because we were so diligent and just thorough in our vetting, I guess. Uh, it kind of helped us on the, on the tail end to actually get the customer. But yes, it was a person that were impersonating the customer and the carrier. Yeah, that is unique. I think one that stands out to me was the, uh, the, the carrier that had bought the web domain, created a web domain for a carrier that had barely run and was not, probably wasn't going to continue operating as a motor carrier, copied their MC number, copied their identity, created an email address uh, and a website operating as somebody that, that did not exist. And, and so that, that to me was one of the more unique examples. But uh, with all the loads that we move day to day, I, it's, it's amazing what you guys do day in and day out to, to make sure everybody's safe and, and operating as who they say they are. As you guys think about technology, it's, it's really changed as a lot of our freight uh, is moving to a digitized environment, connecting to the carrier through portals or through apps. When you look at the onset of a platform where a carrier can go into a site and, and select loads on their own, how has that changed your job over the past couple of years? And I'll start with you, Tanisha, because you see it quite a bit day to day. But if you think about that process of a carrier logging in and, and being able to match freight on their own, how has that changed how you approach your day to day? It's scary. <laughs> well, I'll say it was before we put some processes in place to kind of change who we allow to book themselves and onboard themselves. It can definitely be scary if you don't, again, if you don't know who you're working with. So I love the fact that one of the things we put in place was an admin profile for each motor carrier. So only the email address that is registered with the FMCSA is what's allowed to uh, onboard our portal and book loads for themselves. So I think it um, obviously helps protect us from uh, fraudulent people wanting to onboard themselves and create fake profiles to book shipments. So that is kind of... If you think about a carrier could literally call with an MC and identity 
and, and ask to be onto the portal and then have access to everything, if I'm hearing you correct. And, and things that we've done to protect that is the, is the email validation and contact validation. I, I was talking to our tech team. We also, if you look at the international component of our business, there are motor carriers that, that operate from all over the world, but we put a block on uh, DNSs outside the, the US or outside North America and I think within the first day, there were 180,000 login attempts from, from overseas. So it's, it's kind of crazy to, when you think about security and, and tech, they're very intertwined. And as, as this industry evolves, I think making sure that we're on the front side of that safety is important. And, and the stuff that you guys have done has been, has been great. And it's, it, the success rate is, is very high. So I think that's been something good to see. You know, as we end here today, I, I think this is one of the biggest issues confronting our, our industry as a whole, uh, cargo theft, uh, in particular, identity theft. It's something that's changed. I've, I've, as you look at it today, it's pretty scary. It, the dollar amount across the United States that, that is facing theft is very high. Um, and so looking at the, the protocols and things that you guys have put in place, I, th- looking at our record on the number of loads and the number of times that we've, we've faced this, uh, you've done a, a remarkable job uh, looking at from the leveraging technology, uh, the teams you have behind you, uh, checking the processes that you put in place. Uh, you've done a, a really great job at it. And so I thought it was it was good to start with you today as we start to talk about this um, issue that is going to impact our industry. And, and it not only hurts the shipper, the commodity, but it hurts relationships with carriers and brokers and uh, there's a lot of money tied up into it. So I want to thank you for joining me today uh, to talk through an issue that's that's really important to me uh, and important to our industry. So thank you for listening today to our, our first episode of uh, More Than a Broker. Uh, we're excited to do this. To, we're going to keep exploring different topics uh, uh, from different Im- things that impact our industry, uh, impact uh, companies, uh, sales to execution of freight, And so we're excited to get this going. Uh, Please continue to listen. And until next time, we are more than a broker. Welcome to Head of the Curve, where industry experts discuss the advanced technology driving innovation in the logistics industry. I'm Ben Garvin, Director of Red Technologies. With me today, I have Tyler Hampton, DevOps Manager, Trevor Krupe, our Data Scientist. On today's show, we're discussing how Red Technologies is embracing AI and machine learning to provide our customers with better rates. Tyler, would you give us a quick run through regarding the project, how it started, and really the timeline um, moving into the AI and the machine learning technology? Thank you, Ben, for the introduction. The project for us started about a year ago. We came to a point where we were growing just like a lot of other brokers in the industry, and we had a, a lot of data in a lot of different places, and we needed to bring that all together. We had a lot of ideas that we wanted to do around data engineering, data science, business intelligence. And we really didn't have the data infrastructure to handle that internally. So what we did is we started moving our data to a more cloud forward environment. So we leverage Azure, the cloud provider. We also leverage tools that are hosted within Azure, such as Databricks, Azure Machine Learning, et cetera. Once we were able to bring in all of our data into a data lake environment, you know, Trevor and our other data folks are able to do more data heavy work, uh, more expensive queries that can bring the data that we hold here to the fingertips of our users, whether that be sales, carrier sales, operations folks, et cetera. From a timeline perspective, it's been about a year now and we're about 50 to 75% of the way there, but we're working every day to make sure the data is right for our users, customers, and shippers alike. Thank you, Tyler. Staying with that topic, would did you guys do this all in-house or did you bring partners in? How did you leverage that project? Yeah, so we we leverage a partner that we work with currently. They have three to four folks on the team, and then we have three folks here on our data team that work on the project as well. So um, at the beginning, it was a few people, and we've grown to seven people currently. Excellent. So the segue, that's awesome. Thank you. Moving over to you, Trevor, could you give us from the business approach side, would you give us an overview of AI and machine learning and what that looks like? Once again, just 
keeping it high level. I know you could get really into the weeds and technical and lose me quickly, but moving forward with the, just the AI and the machine learning from the business approach. Yeah, absolutely. AI itself is a super broad field and it essentially encompasses any algorithm that uses intelligence, right? That could be anything from some hard-coded rule set. It could be a linear regression or it can be one of these massive large language models like ChatGPT or BARD from Google. Machine learning is just a subset of artificial intelligence. And honestly, I think it's what a lot of people mean when they talk about artificial intelligence. It's just this very broad class of algorithms that are taught how to perform a certain task by learning from a set of data. And the real beauty of these machine learning algorithms is that instead of being told exactly how to perform a set of tasks, uh, these ML algorithms use some advanced mathematics to actually learn relationships in your data in order to optimize the tasks. And I think that 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 has huge implications for businesses because instead of relying on extremely simple data insights, you know, plotting X versus Y, you can make use of these sophisticated machine learning techniques to pull patterns from your data that could otherwise be hidden extremely deep uh, within your data sets. So Tyler setting the foundation with getting to the AI technology and the machine learning technology piece of it. Now that we have that in place, Talk in, uh, some highlights around really what we've done for the projects and how that benefits Spot and also the customers. Yeah, for sure. And I think logistics is a really unique industry and in that it's sort of this mix between new school and old school where a lot of companies have been very diligent for years about collecting data and harvesting data, um, but have never really taken the jump into hiring data science and kind of utilizing these algorithms. So there's a lot of data scientists like me out there that are really excited to kind of take on these, these challenges. I think the first big challenge that we've tackled with Spot's massive mountain of data that we have um, has been improving our rates on the Spot market. It's a super interesting challenge from a technical perspective because you kind of have to find this perfect balance between quoting a shipper too high because you might price yourself out of it and not stay competitive. But if you go too low, then as a broker, you'd be losing money on every load. So there's this really interesting information asymmetry about how we you know, rate specific markets and rating those specific markets depends on so many factors, you know, number of miles, types of trucks, month of the year. So we've been tackling this problem by using machine learning, right? Because if you throw a machine learning algorithm at this problem, you can find these really deep insights in these really high dimensional data sets. So from a customer perspective, that means getting way more competitive rates while still being extremely confident that we can get your loads from point A to point B really safely. So how's it going? Would you, if you put it on a scale, a grading scale, B plus A, what are, you, what are your thoughts around how the project's currently going? I would give it a B. I think it's been a really exciting project for us to start, but I think moving it into a more intelligent quoting environment from our perspective is going to give us a little bit of a more competitive edge in the future. A lot of customers want real-time rates, and with this environment and with this model, we're able to give that to them. From an internal perspective, we also need to make sure that we're giving rates that our sales folks can be confident in and that we know that we can provide service for our customers as well. So you touched on the control piece. And the one thing that I've picked up, I know that some users believe, oh my gosh, they're taking this away from us. Now they're going to push this into you know this model. Does it go through the pricing piece of it to, to stay with that topic? You really need and pushing hard for the users, right? Because you need that feedback to really tweak and improve across the board. Trevor, would you mind touching on that piece? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Getting feedback from sales is probably one of the most important things that we've started doing because account managers, they know the market, right? They know the changes in the market. They know what needs to be done in order to win a load. And I, I would say that the point isn't to replace, you know, account managers, right? The point is to allow them to do their jobs, right? They don't have to spend so much time quoting loads and worrying about pricing, right? They can focus on getting your stuff from point A to point B. It's that speed and accuracy, right? So you're yeah, going to give them, you know, the better rates and also give it quicker as well. So right. that- and I think that the the main place that we've we've seen a lot of success with this is on quotes that come in so quickly that they don't have time to go through and rate all of them, right? So now you can quote a thousand things in an hour and you can be confident about your quote. Yeah. So it increases the volume, which is awesome. So if you fast forward and I have, you know, some thoughts of my own on this topic, but, you know, six months, a year, two years down the road, what does, you know, the AI, the machine learning, what does that do for spot? And then also the future for our customers and our prospects too? I think the most obvious next step is probably to use 
some of our insights into pricing the spot market and take that to the contractual side. The contractual market rates tend to be a little bit more stable since you're talking averaging over these really long periods of time. But you have to also have to be extremely cognizant of some of the larger scale seasonal fluctuations that you have to see. And a lot of those seasonal fluctuations, the best way to handle those is through machine learning, AI, statistical inferencing, those sorts of techniques. Um, I think another big area that we're really excited to tackle is the carrier sourcing side. This is a big piece that affects pretty much all aspects of our business. Of course, customers want a competitive rate, but I think even more importantly, they want to make sure that the things that they're shipping are in good hands, right? And on the carrier side, we want to make sure that we're going with the best of the best and that the really good carriers aren't losing out to um, some of the things we're seeing a lot like double brokering. So this is a similarly tough problem to tackle, but I think it's vital not just to the success of Spot, but also to the success of the customers and the carriers that we work with. Tyler, would you throw anything in there with just the future of you know the benefits around AI and machine learning? Yeah, I think one of the most important pieces that we're going to cover next is going to be that carrier selection piece. We have a lot of location data and we have that data internally and there's a lot of market data as well that we can use to really help our carrier sales team create those relationships and, and really bring that ease and that peace of mind to our customers to make sure that our you know their product is getting from A to B safely. And I think we can use, we can leverage a ton of AI and machine learning to really find that carrier that's going to match that lane perfectly and provide really good service. Right. And I think Tyler mentioned a word that I think is really important here, which is the point isn't to go out and immediately grab a carrier. It's the point is to build these relationships, right? We want to make sure we're building relationships with good carriers that we really care about and really care about us. Yep. And I, I would throw in there, I, I think it's awesome. I'm excited about just the enhancing the relationship with our customers. When you think about, you know, before COVID, people looked at the source to consumption or supply chain or supply chain end to end, you know, the visibility there. And we're a sliver in that and what we can bring for our customers to help them enhance real time, you know, visibility, overall efficiency, you know, bottlenecks, you know, drive down cost with with that piece. I think it's huge. So I'm I'm excited about that as well for our customers and for spot. So my last question, Trevor, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Would you rather have better data or a better model? This is the uh, the age old question in data science, right? And the true correct answer is you want to have both, right? And context is extremely important here where, you know, if you have great data, but a bad model, it's not going to look good. If you have bad data, but a good model, it's going to be equally as bad. I think, especially in logistics, one of the things you have to remember is that when you create a model for pricing, for example, your model is going to be as good as your brokers, right? If your brokers tend to do certain things, your model is going to pick up on those biases and it's going to tend to do certain things. So I think in the logistics industry specifically, having good data is really important. And I would probably put having good data over having a good model. There you go, folks. Better data. Thanks again, Tyler, Trevor. I appreciate your time. Have a great day. Welcome to Spot's Market Update segment. My name is Andrew Kropp, and I'm the CFO and COO at Spot. I'm excited to be hosting this edition of the Market Update and to be joined by two of our other senior leaders, Alex Beening and Ryan Scott. Alex recently celebrated his 10th year with Spot and is a national account director working with a variety of shippers in the just-in-time segment of the market. And Ryan is Spot's director of carrier sales. Ryan has over 12 years of experience in transportation, having worked at a large asset-based carrier prior to joining Spot in his current role. To kick us off, I'd like to start with Alex and get some perspective on market demand factors. We saw over the summer, while we typically have a peak season, that that didn't really materialize this year. Alex, is that consistent with what you're seeing from a customer standpoint? Yeah, I would say mostly. We definitely saw some tightening, especially in your more probable areas, the Southeast, South Texas. Saw some lightning of California, the West Coast in particular, for quite some time, that seems to be picking back up. But generally speaking, this uh, the, the produce season, as we call it in this industry, was pretty vanilla. We've certainly seen some tighter market conditions in previous years. And this time around, we mostly around the holiday, um, Memorial Day, 4th of July. Those were probably our tighter times of the summer. But generally speaking, it wasn't sustained through the entire summer as we've seen in some recent years. And Ryan, any thoughts from you from the carrier perspective? Uh, obviously, there've been a lot of moving parts when it comes to carriers, but what has the peak season been like from that side? 
Yeah, I mean, just to echo Alex, the summer peak was pretty pretty muted, I would say. You know, the produce season came late this year and was not quite nearly as robust as what we've seen in years past. So that didn't have the impact we typically would see. Demand surrounding July 4th holiday, we saw a small spike, but even then, tender rejections only got up to about four and a quarter percent. I think all of us were waiting to see what would happen after the holiday. It really kind of settled back down into pre-holiday levels pretty quickly. So yeah, I think, you know, contract rates are still coming down. I think we've seen since the last time we, we, we talked, you know, compression between contract and spot rates, but I think it's slowing a bit on the contract rate side and, you know, spot rates have really settled in sort of bouncing around the bottom. So I think not quite the peak we would typically see and, you know, back to school time, we usually see a spike and we just haven't really seen that this time. Either. Yeah. I think one factor that I thought about quite a bit as we headed into the peak season is the capacity side of the equation. You know, th there's been a lot of press, a lot of discussion around carrier bankruptcies, carriers struggling with where the rate environment is. While I think that's happened to a certain extent, it hasn't been a wholesale exodus, at least from what I've seen. W what's your take from the carrier side on that one? Yeah, I think I would agree with you there. I think there's been, you know, some bleeding off of capacity and I think we'll continue to see that, but it hasn't been, we haven't seen that big wave that everyone's been waiting for. And so, you know, you look at some of the large public carriers, you know, their Q2 earnings were pretty weak and, and their outlooks were all pretty modest for the second half of the year, but we haven't really seen on the, on the full truckload side, any really noteworthy um, capacity exits. So I think it's something we'll have to monitor, but, you know, barring any unforeseen external factors coming in, I, I would say any of the carriers who are tied more heavily to contract freight have obviously been, been healthier during this time and, and will probably be, be fine on the backside of this. But as we talked about last time as well, any of those carriers who are tied really closely to the spot market are going to be being in trouble. We know, you know, the spot, current spot rates are not sustainable uh, for carriers at, at a level of profitability. So uh, the sooner that changes, the better. And the volume too, right? I mean, just the, the volume in the spot market has been minimal given what we've talked about on tender acceptance rates. So you've got both the low rate environment plus a lower volume level. Alex, I guess from your perspective and, and thinking about shippers, routing guides, as we head into the fourth quarter, we typically see some of the holiday volumes and, and things start to impact the market. I guess, what thoughts do you have in terms of how customers are thinking about the end of this year? Yeah, it's really interesting. And you, you sort of segued exactly where I wanted to go, kind of piggybacking off of uh, the two of you here. What's been the most interesting to me this year is not what the market has done and how produce season has reacted or the, the end result. And, and again, I'm customer facing here. It's the strategies within the customers to their routing guides. We're seeing, or I'm seeing a lot of reshaping on carrier strategy amongst our largest customers. And with that said, I mean, doing more with less, more business with less carriers. You know, I think there's still quite a bit of lingering afterthought of the market tightness, the supply chain constraints that we experienced coming out of uh, 2020 through 21, 22. And the core partners stood out. The cream of the crop rose to the top, and I think customers, broadly speaking, are wanting to kind of shed that dead weight on a carrier standpoint. Yeah, and I think Ryan could probably allude to this, but we have the same mentality, right? L let's identify the best partners to work with, not the widest range, not securing the lowest rate that's out there, but finding that, that right balance between meeting the service requirements and also having the rate in a reasonable place. It, you know, it, I would say it's almost refreshing to have a little bit of normalcy in the market, given where oh, the last, yeah. you know, two to three <laughs> years have been. That's for sure. We were all praying for it, you know, for about 24 months there for a while. When are we going to see a normal again? I think we're there now. In fact, I, I would even argue, I think the data, the market data is starting to point to that we are starting to see a little bit of tightening and an increase in market rates. Nothing substantial, but maybe we are getting away from that continued lull. And I think the economy, I mean, you can speak to that too. I mean, the economy is a big part of it too. What's the consumer spending? What's the appetite on spending, discretionary spending amongst the, the American consumer? Ryan, I guess I did want to circle back to something we talked about briefly earlier in terms of 
stresses on the carrier and bankruptcies and the like. Do you think that carriers are by and large struggling or do you think that they're able to get by? Profit levels aren't where they certainly had been. But is your sense that that they're doing OK with where things are or are they still on the wrong side of that cost revenue equation? Yeah, I think it's really, you know, tale of two stories, really. You've got the the fleets that are tied, like I said before, more heavily in the contract rate space with shippers directly versus, you know, typically your, your smaller carriers who, who, let's face it, are a little more reliant on the spot market. Um, I think the larger carriers who who are working more closely with directly with shippers or with broker partners who who have a lot of dedicated freight those will be in a better spot are they all profitable lanes right now absolutely not and are there periods of in pockets of situations where we're we're looking at carriers who are, are teetering on that edge right now absolutely and i think that's the thing we're waiting to see is uh, you know that lower segment of the profitability uh, side on the carriers who's going to come out of the back side of this and i think it's it's going to be interesting to see yeah i mean it feels like we're we're always somewhat living on that razor's edge of you have a couple of points of capacity come out of the market 2% of capacity come out of the market can have a huge impact on rates. And, and we could suddenly find ourselves back not too far from the craziness that we all just live through. So it will be very interesting to watch as we get towards the tail end of the year. I guess to wrap things up, either of you have any sort of closing comments or thoughts you'd like to share with the group? Alex, anything from your end? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, since we're wrapping things up more on a forward looking standpoint, as we as we wrap up this year, what do we expect? What looking into my crystal ball, what do I foresee? Right. Yeah. That's what everyone here. wants to know. Right. <laughs> I would expect uh, pretty similar conditions to what we are experiencing now. That could obviously change. Uh, I don't foresee rates another downward trend of sustained rate decreases within the market. It would be hard to see things go a lot lower than where we've been, right? Exactly. We would be going into the territory of, of negative operating costs for carriers, Uh, uh, no matter the market on, on across the board, they would be going into negative operating territory. And that's when you start to see these, the mass exodus. And I don't think we quite have been, the market in general has been playing too much in that negative territory. We've been like right at the, break even operating costs and that pointing back to we haven't quite seen the mass exodus within the industry that some feared heading into 2023 has it happened with some fleets yes absolutely a major one with with yellow that that made national news but for the most part we're not seeing a significant dropout i know ryan was pointing to that with the mid to small fleets that we had mostly feared going into this year ryan any closing thoughts on your side yeah i think the the second half of the year, I don't think there's anything right now that that's pointing to any real strong predictable changes. So I think I don't think any of us would be surprised if we sort of bounced along the bottom here for a while. And then I think to the earlier point, those who can sustain that, I think will come back, come out on the other side of it even stronger from a carrier perspective. You know, we are getting close to the fall and that can always be an interesting time. Yeah, you know, I, was, heading, I was about to make a weather reference, hitting, right? All it know, takes is a hurricane. Season, or, <laughs> so, you know, there are, you know, a lot of things. We've all been through this for several years. So all it takes is one one significant weather event, you know, on the backside of another economic condition. And, and all of a sudden you've got a, a swing in the market that can change things on, on, on a dime. So we'll see, but it'll be an interesting fall, I'm sure. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap for More Than a Broker. You heard firsthand accounts from industry experts and Spot's hardworking individuals revealing a culture of collaboration and innovation. For more information about Spot, our service offerings, our people and culture, our job postings and more, check us out online at spotinc.com. That is spotinc.com. Thank you for listening and for being part of this journey. Until next time, keep striving to be more than a broker.